So, Dr. Gogi, you can, I will, I will give you one, two, three, then we can start, please. So, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor Adrian. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Welcome to this edition of the Legal Studies Association webinar. My name is Tosin Bugi, and I am an assistant professor of English and Africana Studies at Marquette University. This webinar focuses on graduate school application and experience in North America. We're extremely lucky today to have six panelists, I think we're still expecting someone, who are gonna be speaking to different dimensions of the application process. Today, they will also be sharing their experiences, what works, what doesn't work, what to consider in choosing schools, among other things. Now to the panelists. The first panelist I have here is Ayodeji Adigbite. Ayodeji Adigbite is a PhD student in history of science, medicine, and technology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And his research focuses generally on the history of health and infectious diseases in Africa. Presently in the third year of his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he wrote his MA thesis on the historical epidemiology of yellow fever in West Africa, 1800 to 1930, in the same university. Ayodeji received his BA from the University of Illinois and also has an, a master's degree in peace and strategic studies from the same university, that is University of Illinois. For the latter MA, his thesis centered on the legal state management of the Ebola crisis and its implications on health security. The second person that I have here today is Samuel Adebushokan. Samuel Adebushokan is a PhD student in the Department of English at the University of Victoria. He focuses on post-colonial literature and theory in his research, as well as post-colonial media, media fiction, decolonial forms of storytelling, and imaginative making with media in terms of their aesthetics and politics. The third person I have here is Omoyemi Adishibutu. Omoyemi Adishibutu holds a bachelor's degree in English and literature with minor in social studies from Taisola University of Education in Nigeria. She also has an MA in English with a concentration in literature from New Mexico Highlands University, Las Vegas. She was a Fulbright FAT from 2014 to 2015 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Yemi is currently a PhD student, a PhD candidate in the Comparative Literary Studies Program at Northwestern University. She's a cluster fellow of the Critical Theory Program, an African Studies Seminar, which she co coordinated briefly last year. She's also the graduate coordinator of the Poetry and Poetics Colloquium in our home department of English. Yemi's research interests are critical theory, 21st century diaspora writings and theory, post-colonial feminist theories, West African literature and orality, and pre-colonial gender narratives, especially in, West, in Southwestern Nigeria. I also have here today, Theophilus Okunlola. Theophilus Okunlola has two master's degrees in English from the University of Lagos and Mississippi State University. He's currently studying for his PhD at the Department of English, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's interested in post-colonial theory and literature most especially the representations of violence and cultural memory. Then I also have Yolanda Osondo. Yolanda Osondo received a BSc and MSc from the University of Lagos. She is at present a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Calgary. Her current research explores female experiences within the justice system in colonial Nigeria. Yolanda has, was awarded the Chancellor Norfolk Scholarship in 2018 and she's a two-time recipient of the Abata Graduate Excellence Scholarship. Our research interests include African legal history, gender studies, history of crime and justice system. And then I will take um, Esther's um, profile, who, who is, I think she will join us on this program. Esther O. Ajailowo holds an Emmy in Multicultural Women's and Gender Studies from Texas Women's University. 
a master's degree in international law and diplomacy from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, and a BA in philosophy, first class honors from Obafemi Awolo University, Ilefe. She was trained in human rights and United Nations systems at the United Nations University, Tokyo, Japan. Prior to commencing her graduate program in the US, Esther worked for 11 years on Earth, um, on Earth, gender, human rights, and development issues in Nigeria with both non governmental and governmental organizations, including the US mission in Nigeria. Her dissertation, Decolonizing Childbirth, Women, Traditional Birth Attendants, and Reproductive Justice in Nigeria, explores the significance of indigenous birthing knowledge and women's sociocultural and spiritual birthing standpoints for reproductive justice. Among other several international and competitive scholarships and awards, Esther received 2020, 2020 to 2021 Mellon Fellowship uh, Foundation, Mellon Foundation Funders Social Science Research Council's International Dissertation Research Fellowship, and the 2020 to 2021 American Association of University Women International Fellowship. Thank you all for um, joining us today um, on this edition of um, LSA webinar. So I will, we have about seven questions there and the way they're gonna go is that I will post the questions and then we will, um, I mean, we'll respond in the order of our name. So the first person that would respond um, will be in this case, Deji would be the first person to respond and then um, Samuel will be the second person and then we'll go to Yemi and then from Yemi we'll go to Theophilus and then we'll go to um, Yolanda. So each panelist will have two minutes to address um, or to speak to each of the um, questions that we're going to pose. The first question that I have here is preparing for the graduate record exam. How did you prepare for the graduate um, um, record exam, which is GRE? And we're asking that because we know that that particularly is something that a lot of people often ask. Like that is very tough. Like that is not something um, that I want to write or how do I go about it? You know, um, how you know what do I need basically um, to be able to to ace it, to to pass it, and um, what, what kind of score? And I know that it's not everybody on this panel who um, who actually also wrote the GRE, right? Um, so if you can also speak to that, that will also be very great. So did you? Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, first of all, I'll say that I'm very happy to be here. And um, you know, particularly because I'm I'm a beneficiary of um, you know this initiative. You know, the first time I learned about how to apply to PhD programs actually from uh, LSE, and then it was by you know just Prof himself, you know Professor Said alone, you know, and I was really, really very curious. So you are saying I won't, I don't have to pay to go to grad school in the US. You know, that I can actually do this because of my, you know, qualification on, you know, if I'm committed and dedicated, I can do this. So, yeah. And then I'm, I'm, I'm here now, it's my third year. And so I'm really very happy and grateful, you know. And so I'm very happy to be here. So, uh, I mean, I would, about the question, I would say that, I'll probably say that I'm the wrong person to ask the question because I didn't write the GRE. But I was actually preparing for the GRE, right? You know, I had months of preparation before, you know, I stumbled on you know, my eventual school. And um, the first thing I did, you know, as part of the training that I got on, you know, applying for grad school was to actually ask for a waiver. So this is another way. And it's another thing that is, in, you know, that's a trend now in, in across um, schools in the US, you know, particularly because of the pandemic, right? And a lot of schools are waiving um, um, GRE, you know, requirements. So I think then the, you know, about the GRE, what I can say is that in as much as, you know, you, you are encouraged to, you know, prepare for the GRE, you know, and all, it is also, we should also put it in mind that we can actually ask for a waiver, particularly because, um, you know, the language of instruction is English. In, in, in Nigeria. So that could go to like the grad coordinator or you know your potential you know advisors. I, I think I wrote not only uh, the grad coordinator and uh, my eventual advisor then that's you know 
can I get a waiver? Having perused the the website very, you know, the school website very well, so I understood that I could actually get that. So, but I had to also send in a paper that I'd written. You know, Abet wasn't published then, so I, you know, they asked for a paper and I sent it in, and you know, they read it and I felt like that I'm good. So, you know, the GRE was waived for me. I've been, you know, taking my time to prepare for it. So, I mean, that's that's one way to answer the question about uh, Jerry. Thank you very much, DJ. So to Samo. Um, okay, um, thank you. I want to say hello to everyone. And um, it's my pleasure to be here today and to be part of this panel. And I will say in my case, I didn't write the GRE exam. And, um, because I applied, I'm, I'm studying here in Canada and um, the program as well as the university waived um, the GRE examination. So it's not expected of graduate students to write the GRE exam, only if the program specifically requires you to write that exam. So I wouldn't have um, much to say about that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Samo. Then to Yemi. Hi everyone, um, thanks for being here and I'm really excited to be here. So what I would say is I wrote GRE twice. So I think I can speak on this. So what I would say is like um, Ayodeji said, decide, I would say decide if you need a GRE and um, ask for a waiver if you can get it. And if they say no, so in my case, the first time I wrote the GRE, um, I didn't even know. So I was, I came for Fulbright and I was just going to like finish Fulbright and go back to Nigeria. And they're like, you can apply for a master's and get funding. I was like, really? So I, I had no time to prepare. And I was just like, I focused on the, which brings me to my second point of you need to study smart. So once you've decided that you need the GRE, you need to study smart. And here's what I mean by that. So when I first, um, the first time I wrote GRE, which was in 2014, I was so focused on the quantitative reasoning um, because, well, it's mostly like high school math and statistics and of course, like, I don't do well in that. So I was just like banging my head on the wall, like trying to get all the quantitative thing like practice in. And I completely like ignored um, like the essay part. Like I only started studying for that, like looking at it like two days before the exam. Well, I got 3.0 in the writing. I got like 150 something in the English and it's the lowest score you can get in quantitative reasoning that I got. So then in when I was applying, so eventually, well, I got into the school I got into for my master's actually found my name like in the GRE directory. So even if you don't necessarily need it, if you can take it and you can afford it, I would encourage you to do so. So they found my name in the GRE directory and they sent me um, a letter to apply to their school. And the letter came like two days after I got my second rejection from the master's program I'd applied to because of incomplete um, application packet. The professors in Nigeria did not send um, reference letters anyway so I went there so when I was applying for PhD I started studying like in January I did one hour every day um, just practicing but what I did was so I knew part of studying smart is this focus on what you need so I knew that the schools I'm applying to the kind of programs I'm also applying to um, they need to see like you're a strong writer, you can make arguments and all of that. So this time around, I spent the bulk of my time on the essays. I, since I've been able to establish that's what I needed. So I spent my time on that. And I'll tell you, the essay pool of GRE is about 325 essays on both um, 
the argument and the issue essays. And it was, well, I do things that way anyway. So I started going through the, the essay questions one by one, and I started grouping it. Let me tell you, if you go through those essays, you will not be surprised on the exam day because they pull questions from those pools. So I try to just like group them. And I, at the end of the day, like some essays up to like 10, they're saying the same thing, just framed differently. So I started like practicing and I knew like, okay, if I get this question, this is what they're asking, this is what they're asking, this is what they're asking. So when I wrote um, GRE the second time, I got 5.0. I got five on, on, on the essay. I eventually did not need it because my program don't require GRE, but then like I applied to like several schools. So like, I was just like sending it like, see, I can write, I can do research. So that's what I'll tell you. Decide if you need it and study smart. Thank you very much, um, Yemi. So um, Theophilus, can you share your own experience with us? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate being on this uh, part of it. I remember I attended a couple of these while I was in Nigeria. If you can, your voice, if you can, fundamental frequency. <laughs> Which one is fundamental frequency? Um, so, um, can you hear me better now? Okay. As I said, I, I appreciate being on this panel. Um, I attended a couple of these when I was in Nigeria and um, applying. So straight to the point, uh, GRE, yes, I did GRE, I did GRE. And um, I think uh, like, uh, I think as Yemi mentioned, I'm a very terrible student at mathematics. So that didn't help my life, the, the maths part. I knew it was, it was a no-go area. But I worked on, I worked on English, um, I worked on English a lot, uh, the English part of it. And yeah, basically it's, there, there are resources online, which is one thing I will say. So you have uh, K-Plan, you have a uh, Manhattan exam. Some of them are behind paywalls, but some of them are free. So you could actually use some of these resources to practice too. It's, uh, it's there to use. And if you have friends, for example, I, I didn't know much. I had to rely on one of my friends, Teniola. On a day, uh, back in uni lab, there was one teaching me the maths for the most part. So use people too, especially when you have um, some of these resources and you have the kind of questions they set. But more importantly, I think um, Deji mentioned this, that because of the pandemic, many universities are waiving GRE now. A lot of universities are waiving GRE. So yes, you can look into that. But also there are also other universities who even before the pandemic, they had uh, waived GRE. So it's important to do your research. Look at the universities you want to apply to. What's their stance on GRE? Is there a way you can um, go through the process without submitting? Because it's a lot of money. And if you reinvest that money into applications into other universities, it would save you something. So definitely resources online, use resources online, use people, especially in the areas of your weaknesses then, also use loopholes in the system. If they don't require it, then fine. You don't have to do it, it's not necessary. But if they do require it, do it. All in all, make, put a diligent effort and be intentional about it. Thank you for raising your fundamental frequency. I appreciate it a lot. Anyways, so Yolanda, your experience? Um, thank you everyone for attending this panel and thank you Alessi for the opportunity to speak. Um, I did not have to write the GRE because it wasn't a requirement for um, my course of study. So I really don't have so, so many things to say or anything to say about it. But I think one thing I'll advise is it's very important that you um, do your research and find out um, the requirements for the course you're applying to so that you know what is expected of you. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, thank you, Esther, for joining us. Um, I think the question we have right here, it's preparing for the graduate record exam, which is GRE. Can you share your own experience with us? How did it go? What did you have to do to be able to 
uh, get that hard to scale. Hi, thanks everyone. And I apologize for joining late. I had said this for noon my time instead of 11. So I apologize. Um, so my experience with the GRE, so I have to take that once because I just wanted to be prepared and ready. And I knew I'll be applying to schools that might need it. And so for me, it was more like just wanted to do the GRE and I kind of probably like put the cut before the earth because um, probably should have checked to see, okay, would these schools need it and what would they need and all of that. But I just wanted to have that at hand because um, I've just heard that it's one of the things that you have to do. So I just wanted to want to do it. And um, I had to, um, so at the time I was working at, at the US consulate, so I had resources and I was able to use the, uh, the US consulate education advice and services and all the resources at the library. So I think I had that opportunity to just be able to rely on those resources, which I think might not be available for, um, um, for everyone. And that's something that you might want to look into, like USA, um, Education USA at the US consulate when they open back up. They have like great resources and then you can just like make use of that. You can go to their library and they have great people that would help you through that. So I had to do that once and it was it was good experience. I'm not the, one of the strong people in mathematics as well. So I have to focus on that, which I think wasn't my strength. So um, I didn't like spend so much time on the other um, aspect because I thought that, you know, I would do well, not that I didn't prepare, but I have to focus on what I think was in my strength so that I can scale through. And then it was good, although I didn't have to use it, but it was good experience that I was able to do that and told myself, yeah, so you can actually do this and you can actually pass. So that was just my own experience with that. But eventually I didn't have to use it because it wasn't required for the program that I'm in now. And most of other programs that I applied to, I didn't have to use the GRE as well. So. Thank you, everyone. I just want to reinforce two things that people say. Um, don't be afraid that you are going to fail it. Um, because I know that's one of the um, things that scare people. So when they first see the question, they're like, I'm going to fail this exam. Don't be afraid. I think familiarity with the you know, questions is perhaps the most important thing. And like Amy said, it, it is very important for you to have the you know, a, a, a time to study, a study time that you devote to it. Um, in my own experience, I think that having like set on aside maybe um, two hours every day or three hours every day consistently for, depending on how, how, how much time you have, two months, three months, and you are consistent with it. Um, I haven't seen anybody who did that and failed. The other thing that I also think is very important is the online, there's an online simulator. The online simulator is you have all these questions. And when you are right there, it's like you're writing that exam. So if you are able to use that online simulator many times before you write that exam, it's like you already have an idea of the kinds of, I mean, what range you know, of, of scores you're likely to get. And in my experience, I, I believe that um, whatever score you are getting with the online simulator, if you continue with it, you're ever going to get something higher. So please keep that in mind. I will, share a link right here um, as we continue to talk um, where you can you know find some of the online you know um, online materials where you can practice all right moving on to the second question um, taking the test of english as foreign language and again we know that it's not everybody who actually um, had to do that so if you didn't do that how did you navigate you know the waiver and i will start again with dg Sorry, if I guess you correctly, is, um, is that um, IELTS? So it can be IELTS, it can be TOEFL, right? Okay. Did you, okay. did you, did you have to do it or did you okay. have to waive it? Yeah, yeah. Again, I didn't do that. Um, you know, I don't want to repeat myself again, but um, I think, um, you know, as, you know, every other person from panelists have said, do the research, right? Um, I feel like a lot of schools in the US don't ask for both. Um, the first time I saw that, um, the first school I saw that um, requested for that was West Carolina University then. And, um, you know, I was like, I mean, I, it's, it's, um, I had to deal with the GRE. I was still reading, you know, for the GRE. 
and then do I have to do like I think they requested two full day, but um, yeah. So what helped was you know the research that I did. I knew that um, you know there are universities that don't um, request for for that, so I just decided to you know write the waiver. So I think again, you know, learn how to write like you know really good emails, right? Um, if you're writing emails to ask for to request for a waiver then you know that um, it's in, in itself, it's a test of English language, right? You know, so be careful, the, the kinds of, um, you know, your, your language construction and all that, um, you know. I mean, and then have people read, you know, the, even the emails for you, right? You know, don't just think that it's just an email, you know, and then, you know, there are lots of um, ethics about, you know, writing emails that I also learned from the LSC, you know, but also reading um, templates online, right? Um, so. In itself, it's a test of English language, you know, when you're doing that. And, and it's also helped that I had also, you know, written and you know, something before. So I had to send that because that was the first thing I was asked to do. So if you're saying you don't want to write GRE and, you know, this exam, send in what you have written. So let's see, you know, if you actually, you know, so I sent that and then, you know, immediately I sent that, you know, I was just told that um, that has been waived for me. So, and that's that's the comment I would say about the other tests. Thank you, DJ. Um, Samo. Um, yes. Um, I didn't write any English proficiency test too, and um, I think many schools here in Canada don't require um graduate students from certain English speaking countries to write any proficient English proficiency test, uh, whether IELTS or self people any other one. And in my case, I didn't write any. Um, the university does not require it. If you are from Nigeria and some countries, English speaking countries in Africa and of course in the Caribbean. And neither does the um, English program require it to. So I didn't write it. And uh, of course, because I already had a degree in English from Nigeria. And um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't want to write it to anyway. So I didn't write it. Thank you. Then to Yemi. So like um, the previous panelists have said, ask, like know if it's required and ask for a waiver. I think, um, it's disappointing that a lot of university or some a lot of universities, like especially in the West, they don't um, consider like our English English, which is insulting. I find that personally insulting because when people ask me, "What is your first language?" I'm like, "My first language is English." What is wrong with you? Anyway, so ask for a waiver. And like Aya Deji said, if you're sending an email for a waiver, make sure that your email does not require TOEFL in itself. So ask for a waiver and if they be like, oh, they cannot waive it, send them something like, oh, here is something I've written to show you that um, I can speak English or like I can function. So do that. I, I wrote TOEFL <laughs> again. <laughs> It was, it was because of Fulbright. And I would say like, if your English is like good, you might not, you just need to see like the, the method because I think all of these exams, they have their tricks to them. So once you need, once you know, even IELTS also, once you know, okay, this is how this is the method to this exam. I think that's mostly it. When I wrote um, TOEFL, I registered on a Friday and I took the exam on a Monday and I got 102, like without practice. I was at work the whole time. So, well, I was working as the writer. So just know the methods to this, but first ask for a waiver. When they be like, oh, you need, just be like, I'm from Nigeria. English is our official language can you please waive? My sister had to have asked for a waiver also, and they gave it to her um, when she applied to Bowling Green State University. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Then, um, Theophilus. 
Yeah, um, my, my experience is similar to uh, what Yemi just mentioned. So uh, as everyone has, has, has said, um, uh, again, when you research some of these universities, you would find that some of them have waivers. In fact, some of them will say uh, students from these countries and you will see Nigeria there. Now, some of them would need you sending emails. And I think probably later we'll get to email ethics because I think I have a ton of things to talk about email ethics, um, but emails, emails, send emails, try to, and again, as Yemi said, that got me actually laughing. Make sure your email doesn't require TOEFL. You know what that means. So um, yeah, send emails, ask them, tell them you, you're from Nigeria. I mean, Britain colonized Nigeria, English is illegal franca in Nigeria. Tell them, some of them are not that educated. Trust me, they don't know. So tell them, make them know and assert yourself. There is, there is nothing there. Now, there is one other thing. Some of them will tell you they need the test that you took. Um, they need an evidence that your courses are taken in English. So in some transcripts, some universities actually have it that um, courses in these universities are taught in English language. So all you just need to do is just show them that and that, that's all. But I, 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 took, I took TOEFL, but I didn't take it to get to the United States. In fact, it was one program I was applying to after I got here. And again, as Yemi said, the day I took TOEFL, I had a seminar course, I had a presentation. It was so overwhelming the day before. So I didn't practice. I didn't practice at all. And I went for the exam. In fact, I dozed in the middle of the exam because the day before I slept around 5 a.m. because I was working. So I, was, I dozed in the middle of doing the TOEFL and I had 106. I didn't practice. So there is no fear there. Yeah, once you know how to speak English, at least you know how to write, you know how to hear, and it's just very basic. Don't stress over. TOEFL is far easier than GRE, as a matter of fact. It's, I mean, but you can always get your way. Thank you. Yolanda? So I also did not have to write an, um, the English exams, but I, I will still repeat the importance of doing your research and asking questions because um, my roommate is in the same university as I am, but she had to write an English exam, but it wasn't required for me. And so it's very important that you find out what is the requirement for your department and then um, make sure you know who, what, you, what is expected of you. Thank you. Um, Esther? Pardon me. So I've had the both experiences of having to write TOEFL and then having to write a waiver. So um, for schools in the UK, I think mostly they kind of like understand that Nigeria was colonized by Britain and that English is a language of instructions in our schools and all that. And I think for some of them, so I've applied to um, and gained admission to Oxford, LSC and all those couple of places without having to have, write TOEFL. But of course, I didn't take up the admissions because they wouldn't offer me full funding and then we all know what it is. But it was just like good experience to know that, you know, they would waive it for you. I didn't have to write emails. I, I, what I did was to write more like a, a statement, like a one page thing that you would read and then it has to really be strong. Like everyone has talked about, like it has to be strong. This is more like your, res your TOEFL result, right? So they want to see it there. So you want to make sure that that is, um, written really very well, like have someone look over it for you. If um, writing is not your one of your strengths, because we have talked about like, you know, people like me not wanting to deal with numbers. I know that some people can really like speak English and all of that, but perhaps you're not like strong in writing or some of us are like, okay, um, you can really like speak so well for the system to catch it because I think that can also really be tricky, the speaking aspect of it, right? So. I think I'll just take you on after the other. Talking about the, uh, the waiver now, I wrote, wrote one page thing to like one, it's a lingua franca, devoting like each paragraph to each of those points, right? It's a lingua franca, like if you don't know we're colonized by Britain, and this is two, it's a language of instruction in all the schools that I attended, that you can tell them like your, your score in your WIAC or in your jam, right? Like, okay, have my transcript to show that you that, you know, all my courses were taken in the English language. Okay, I've been working for X number of years in, you know, at this place, the US consulate, English is our primary, like, you know, language of communication. So like, just like 
telling them all of those things and then writing in such a way that whoever reads it knows that you know you have this you know fluency in written lang i mean english language and you can get by with that for some of the schools that we've all mentioned and other but for this school that i am in now texas women's university it was one of the schools that were like well we can't exempt you I'm like what what do you mean <laughs> right and then i went to your website and they actually exempted some uh some countries from West Africa from writing it. I think the uh, Ghana was actually like exempted. I'm like, why would you not exempt Nigeria? Like I wrote those emails and they were like, well, it's just what it is. I'm like, okay, well, because I want to get into this school, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and then I actually did it. And um, there's also just like um, Dr. Boogie said the other time, like you could, you can practice online for GRE. You can also do that for TOEFL. I can't remember exactly what it's called now, but at the USA um, Education at the Consulate, they also have like a, an online practice and you could use that to test your speaking, right? It tries to like transcribe it for you and you can see some of the things that it's not picking and the places that you need to like, you know, bite on, on your words and, you know, practice and practice. And then it gives you your score so you know how you're doing. Because I think for some people, it's like uh, the speaking aspect of it can really be tricky. And for my school as well, they even have like, um, they have a cutoff for the speaking aspect of it. Because I think they are really like concerned about that because they offer graduate teaching assistantship to um, students and international students as well. So they want to be sure that you're probably able to communicate with students. And of course we can, but perhaps they just want an evidence so if you're required to do it just to say that you can do it you can practice and if you're if you're writing a waiver you can write like a strong one page thing that anyone would read and would be convinced that you actually provisions in the english language thank you thank you just to reinforce i think um people are saying try as much as possible to write to the university so the legacy of colonialism, which is English in Nigeria, can actually help sometimes to, um, you know, get it whipped. Um, so please write to these universities, let them know that, you know, you are from Nigeria, English is the language of instruction in universities and you we know, are from primary school to the university level. Um, and then I also heard um, from what people shared that, you know, might be a very good idea that you know, you share your whatever thing you are writing with people. I do that. I share emails with people around me and like, help me look at these emails. So that's a good practice that can help you, you know, navigate this. Um, some of these um, questions of waiver. All right. The next question that we have here is choosing graduate program and statement of purpose. How do you, what are the very important things for you in choosing a graduate, graduate program? And then how do you go about writing a statement of purpose? And uh, we'll go, go back to Deji. Yeah, um, choosing a graduate program. I mean, for me, the first thing that I did was, you know, I went on Google and I was just like, um, you, know, you know, graduate schools in the US that has that, you know, the best history programs, you know. And then, I mean, I was just using different, um, you know, just, um, you know, twisting it around, like um, that has like funding, you know, graduate schools in the US that has like, you know, different kinds of attributes that uh, came to my mind then. <clears throat> and then I started to, you know, reduce them. I remember opening about, you know, 20, um, different pages, you know, with different schools on my on my laptop. Then, you know, just uh, reading up on the schools. Um, I mean, a few things that I didn't really know then, I know now about. Like, one thing that is important is like um, consulting, you know, faculties. Not just consulting faculties in the school, but particularly you know, trying to consult even graduate students, you know, to know, you know, how the, the system works in the school, you know, how they, whether they support their students and, uh, you know, you know, to just like get a general idea, you know, usually for a lot of schools, 
you know, you would also have, um, say, Nigerian or African students there that you can easily relate to. Trust me, it helps that you have someone that you can relate to or that at least understands your experience, right? Um, so you just ask them, you know, just ask questions. I mean, you won't always get answers from some students, um, as I have learned, but just continue to ask questions. You know, graduate students, um, look for professors. Do your research first. Look for professors whose work speak to yours, you know, whose work overlaps with yours, you know, and then read up on them. You know, you can even read up on, you know, whatever it is they have written, you know, so that's important. So that's, oh, so you wrote on certain thing that, you know, I find, you know, so make that, uh, create that familiarity. Don't just, um, it's not just about the school. Oh, they say Madison is, you know, is really good and then you want to apply there, you know, do you, do they have, you know, something to offer you, you know, and then read up on the faculties, you know, and the faculties, they, they, they are usually links, right? There are links in the school web, on the school websites. For also the grad students, you also see, you know, some of them will use um, people, uh, you know, um, grad students, or, you know, they have different categories. Read up, you know, peruse the internet, like just go deep, you know, do deep dives into, you know, surfing the net, you know, the page of the school and all that should get as much information as you can ask questions too about funding because you know a lot of people would come down here and then they'll be stuck you know they say they can't get funding and all that so make sure you ask those questions those are the kinds of things i was looking at when i was looking for schools and then about the statement of purpose i mean it's a story to me you know so i was i felt like i was telling a story and then what i did was um I connected my, you know, and it's, a, it's an academic story. I connected my um, experience from undergrad to when I was um, seven. And I, I realized that a lot of people use the NYC experience too. So while some people would condemn NYC, that what's this, all this program about? I was able to make the best of my NYC, you know, I volunteered. And um, I probably wouldn't be, you know, a historian of um, infectious disease if I didn't volunteer for Ebola um, crisis, you know, for example, or eventually volunteer for hepatitis B while I was serving. So all of this were weaved into my uh, student program because particularly the question I was, that, that stood out for me was, you know, I was just learning about, you know, the WHO, for example, and then, you know, their response to the Ebola crisis. I was like, why did it take so long for them to respond to <clears throat> the Ebola crisis in West Africa? I was just really curious about that, you know, and that was a central question in my <clears throat> in my um, thesis then in, at the University of Lawrence. So I, you know, weave that into my SOP, you know, to show why I want to historicize infectious diseases, you know. So the SOP to me is an academic story that you're telling, you know, and then. The other thing that I made sure I included in my SOP was I actually looked at um, the faculties that, and I'm working with all of them now, you know, looked at, you know, what they are doing and how it, you know, it speaks to the kinds of questions that I was asking. And so the last paragraph in my SOP was just talking about the kinds of works that um, the faculties are doing, the kinds of programs that they have, at, you know, at the university that interest me. They were doing programs on One Health and, you know, all these programs. I was like, oh, I'm really, really, um, you know, I would love to be a part of this program because of this. And so it was, it's an academic story about the questions that I had. You know, I didn't have a particular research um, 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 PhD topic yet, but I was just, it was about the questions, you know, about my academic journey that, you know, informed my SOP. All right, thank you very much, Didi. Um, please, let's remember to keep our responses short so that we can take as many questions as possible from um, the audience. I think we have a lot of people who have joined us today and they have a lot of questions that we want to ask. So two minutes for each respondent for, for each question. Let's stick to that. All right. Um, so the next person is Samo. Okay. Um, yes, I, I would say you would have to do a lot of research. Um, and I think you can't um, overemphasize that research, research, research. In my case, I developed a GAN chart um, I looked for resources. I listed resources that I needed and what I am looking for in that in the 
in the institution I'll be studying in and um, I'll study now rather. And I wanted to also look at a few other um, options that were available. And I had to just research about them, about the institutions, what they want. And I think the most, um, the most important factor for me is um, whether is the question whether my research in, interest also um, is um, the, the institution has the resources in terms of faculty and maybe library and some other resources um, to help my research. So whether the research and the, my interest, research interest and the institution, whether we are there is a fit between the two. And I think that is the primary factor for me, primary question that I was uh, I was asking myself, I asked myself when I was um, trying to apply for the PhD program that I'm in now. And so uh, that's the advice I would give to anyone who would want to um, apply to a program. Because the truth is that you may not have the money to apply to several institutions. You may not have the money to apply to say um, 10, five. In my case, I applied just to two. Yeah, I applied to two institutions and um, yeah, and I got um, admission. I got uh, admission and admission offer from both institutions. So research is the keyword. Research, research is the research, your interest, research the faculty, research the resources that um, the institution has or whether they would want to give you what you would want from your PhD experience or whether your master's experience, do they have what it takes? Um, so sometimes we often, I think most, the mistake most people make is that they look for the big names. Um, I want to study at um, University of Toronto. I want to study uh, maybe at Yale or something, or some other big or top uh, tier school. And sometimes they miss the point that it's all about whether your research and the institution or whether the institution has resources to, you know, to make your research experience a productive one. So I think that would be my advice. And as for the statement of um, statement of intent or purpose, depending on what uh, how the school calls it. So I would say that you need to also research um, faculty members too. In my case, I had to research um, the faculty members of the schools I wanted to apply to. I wanted to be sure that their research focus, their research interests also intersect with mine too, whether we share similar, um, we share similar interest. And it was required that you also in that in the statement of purpose or intent that, that you um, write about your research, give us your statement of research should be also a research statement that is in both institutions that I apply to it was required that you make a, a research statement too. So and one of the strategies to doing that is researching the works of faculty members. So you try to read up what they are doing, try to read up their papers, their articles or their, maybe some chapters um, of, uh, of books, uh, book chapters that they've written. Try to read up on their research because that would also help you to scaffold your own understanding of what you would want to do. Because um, most of the time, at least when I applied, my research, uh, my dissertation topic was not so clear, and I just had it was just it, of course it was in a state of flux. So I I was trying to develop it, but reading the works of this uh, this uh, faculty members helped, of course, help me get a better idea of what I need to do, what I need to write, what I need to write in the statement, particularly. And sometimes, you know, you need to show that you are not just interested in the school or in the department, but you are interested in working with um, that professor, your, uh, your prospective supervisor, whoever the person is going to be. So you have to show that you're also interested in that person's work. So I think one way of doing that is just by to make that gesture towards um, reading their research, saying, oh, I'm also, I've read your research. I read Professor Sososo's research in his in Sososo journal and uh, you know, he talked about this and that, and 
this we share similar interests, and I hope that it would it would be a productive experience for me working on that supervision and all that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have to move to very quickly to the next um person. Um Yemi. Yeah, so what I would say, I would run through my list like quickly. So first of all, decide if you need a graduate degree. I think that is where you need to start from because I know like as Nigerians or like a lot of Nigerians, it's like we're degree, we're that title centric and it's like, oh, my mates are getting masters, I want a masters. My mates are getting PhD, I want a PhD. What do you wanna do with the masters? What do you wanna do with the PhD? So once you decide what you want to do with it, then do your research. In my case, what I did, so I would tell you what a professor told me when I was doing my masters and I wanted to um, apply for PhD. I was just going to apply to schools that I thought I could get into. And she said, you should not just apply anywhere. What do you want to do? Go find schools that match your research interest, where there are professors that whose work, that their works intersect with yours. So that was what I did. I actually like just Googled like schools that um, offer comparative literary studies. And I started to go through each one and through the faculty to see who I can talk to or whose work matches mine. Because I'll tell you one thing that I've seen and in those that I've like counseled um, who are in graduate programs, the admission, I think a lot, almost half of it, and a, a few professors on admission committees have told me this, they depend on compatibility. So even if it's the best school in the world and you're the best student ever, ever made, if your research is not compatible with any of those professors, they're not going to give you admission. So that is one. You might have the best, um, uh, what is it called? The best packet. It won't work. And I would advise everyone here seeking admission, go to the LSA page or Facebook or wherever they have their resources and go listen to last week's webinar. They did a fantastic job on this, including like contacting professors and all of that, email etiquette and all that. So once you decide that, then if you're writing your statement of purpose, so the statement of purpose is, is like you're traveling. So I want to travel to the UK. How am I going to get there? What have I done to prep for this journey? You need to buy a ticket. You need to get on the plane. When you get to the UK, what are you going to do there? That is basically a statement of purpose. This is what I want to do. This is what I've done in prep for this. And this is what I want to do with what I'm getting from you. So that is basically it. But first, do you need a graduate program? Where? What resources are available? And then you write the statement of purpose. But compatibility matters most. You might be the best. If it's not compatible, it's not going to work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Then we move to Theophilus. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't want to um, reiterate some of the things that people have said. Uh, I will just speak to some specific areas. Everybody has spoken about research. Please research, read the works of professors. I remember all the professors on the panel last week said something very crucial. And uh, one of them specifically said, there is nothing more annoying than receiving an email for a from a student who has not read anything about the professor. You are sending an email to, you have not read anything. You don't know anything about them. So please don't do that. You look foolish when you do that. Okay, so everything everybody has said, but there, is, there are two aspects I would actually want to speak to um, specifically, is the idea of even after you have drafted, drafted your statement of purpose, show people, show people, show people. I think I'm so big on that, show people. And not just showing people, but when people give you reviews, try as much as possible to work on them. Now, I speak about this from a very personal 
point of view. I've, I've, I've had Nigerian students contact me that hello, I want to apply. And I know the struggle everybody goes through. I went through it. So I'm always, you know, I always give myself to that. Okay, you want to do, I will start talking, right? And okay, write something and send to me. Now, when you now send something to me, I, I take my time to actually read people's statement of purpose. And again, the reason I do that is because people did it for me. The likes of uh, Dr. Boogie here, he knew how many conversations we had when I was applying, Dr. Adenrito. So when I read, I, and I'm, I can be very thorough. So if you give me a two page statement of purpose, I think the worst I've done, and when I finished that, I knew Tephilus, he did an overkill. I had 18 comments in a two page. And when I mean 18 comments, it's not one line. Some of my comments can be up to 300 words, a single comment. I can be that thorough. What surprises me, and this has happened many times, people will now send the developed version of the SOP back, and there's almost no development. I think it says a lot about you are not prepared to do graduate work if you cannot invest your time in doing a serious work on your SOP. Um, Kendi said something. He said you must speak to a certain research interest. We're not saying your ideas are well formed yet, but there's a way you will write that they will know that this person is getting at something. And that is extremely crucial. So people on this panel, I, I know many people on this panel respond to people on, on several occasions. I've had other friends and I've had this conversation with them. In fact, one of my friends and I were talking the other day and he said, this, this so, so, so person sent me a statement of purpose. I worked on it and the thing didn't come back. He said, at the point, I, I almost was rewriting the whole thing. That doesn't really, you, if you can't go through the rigor of writing a good SOP, you can never do graduate work. And I'm just being blunt. So yeah, and one other thing I'll speak to is the big school thing. Uh, Harvard, Yale, good for you. It's very good. Everybody wants to go to Harvard. Everybody wants to go to Yale. And I may not be the right person to say this because I'm in quite a good school. But the truth is, the schools you are going does not determine the quality of your work. It is the quality of the research you want to do in light of the kind of resources you have. Harvard may not give you the best work you want to do in a certain area of research interest. It might be a university that is not as close as Harvard. But when you finish there, you'll be better than those students that are coming from Harvard in that area. So learn not to think too much about big schools. Learn to look more for how appropriate is your research to the professors there and how they can help you develop that interest further. That is just the best thing to do in light of that. And that's what I, everybody has said, almost every other thing I'll talk about in terms of preparing for graduate school and SOP. That's what I'd like to add. Thank you very much, um, then Yolanda. Yeah, so everybody has said what I would like to say, but I have like a list of things I think are very important. First and foremost, it's very important that you have a plan map out a plan about the reasons why you want to apply to grad school and give yourself deadlines. I tend to work with deadlines, so give yourself deadlines. Also ask yourself certain questions. Is my transcript ready? Because you, you, you have a deadline to submit your application. So if your transcript is not ready, nobody's going to look through your um, application. Um, have you spoken to professors who are going to write, um, who are willing to write a reference letter for you? Think about who is going to write your reference letter because it's very, very important. You also need to do your own personal research about the professor who, who you want to be um, your supervisor. And in your initial email um, to that professor, when you try to contact the professor, it's important you if you have a, a copy of your transcripts, I think you should include that. If you have a resume showing all the things you've done, um, it's also very important to include that. I would also speak about the importance of reading and editing your statement of purpose. Never underestimate the importance of reading and editing. Like, give it to people. I know in Nigeria, it's a, it's a normal thing when you're applying to schools abroad. You try to, sometimes we, tr we tend to be secretive and that, that's the truth, we tend to be. But you have trusted friends who can do, who can read stuff for you. Theophilus read my statement of purpose. I have other friends who were my colleagues who read my statement of purpose. And I, I, I knew that these people could comment and criticize or critique me and tell me the way it is. So then, um, try to reach out to people and let them um, read your, um, your statement of purpose for you. And um, it's also very important to mention the name of um, the professors you want to, um, who you plan to work with when you go to, um, when you get accepted into the university. And um, yeah, okay, I also need to mention the importance of um, 
the importance of reading about that the, the topic you want to write about. Um, make sure you have a good idea about the literature, what has been written on that topic, and what is the new thing you plan to introduce, the, the, the new um, thing you plan to um, explore in your research. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, then Esther. Thank you, everyone. You've made very important points. And um, so one is, someone had asked, and I think a lot of people reiterated that, like, why do you really need to get into this program? Why do you need to have this degree, right? So that question must, like, must have been answered before you even, like, attempt to really apply to um, a grad school. And another thing you should know is that there are universities in Nigeria, right? There are places you could get, you know, PhD degree and master's degree in Nigeria. So why is it important for you to go outside the shores of Nigeria to get this degree? So what, what is that thing? What is that thing that you're still looking for that you think, you know, you would get outside the shores of your country and in this particular institution that you're applying to? And you need to really be clear about that. So what is, what question are you asking? And what are you able to, I mean, what do you think, you know, this school, this institution, this degree will have to you? And what are those resources that you think you, you'd be able to have access to that if you probably in Nigeria, like in another institution that you would not have access to. So just thinking about like, what do I want? And how is it that you, this institution, this program, you have this thing that I want. And also, what are you also bringing in, right? So you must have done your research. So why should they consider bringing you in? So it, it, it goes both ways. What are you, you know, willing to offer? What are you bringing to this, to this institution? What are you bringing to this program? And what are you trying to get from this degree? And I guess um, either Yemi or Yolanda also talked about like, what would you do with it, right? So you have to be able to have asked yourself all those important questions. And it will reflect in your statement of purpose if you haven't asked yourself these important questions because you won't be able to flow in like writing in and convincing someone about the fact that you, you're really serious about getting you know, into this program and into this institution. So you might have to put a lot of other things into consideration, the location of the school, the schools. Of course, we've talked about like not just looking at the names and all that, but like what you really be able to gain. So for um, when I was applying, I was really like pretty clear about what I wanted to do. Like uh, most of the questions I wasn't, I wanted to use my research to ask. And because I've also like had a lot of um, academic and professional experiences that um, in line with all of these things already. So I was able to say, this is one thing that I needed more. So I have um, had experiences in um, international law, international diplomacy, human rights advocacy, and all of that. I have a background in philosophy and I've been working with you know, uh, organizations on women's rights. So what is more? I felt like I needed like grounding, you know, theoretical grounding in feminist theories, right? So that's what I thought I needed because I felt like there would be something more there because I thought I was getting stuck using all this, uh, you know, experience that I've gained and working. And I still felt like there's still this gap, like what might be there in theories that I'll be able to like get into? What is in, you know, womanism even and how might we be able to bring that to the grass? So I, I was really pretty clear about this is what I was looking for. And at that point was when I had a change from what I was looking for when I searched for school. So uh, prior to 2014, when I was now like, okay, now I know what I really wanted. Prior to then I was like, okay, I wanted to do development studies. I wanted to do international, you know, human rights and all of that. But by the time I had this question, it was clear to me what I needed and what I needed to look for when I was looking for schools. So I was looking for a PhD program in women's and gender studies, but I saw some that would also be more like uh, women in globalization, women in development. I'm like, well, I think I kind of been there, done there and had all these other things that would make up for that. So I was really looking for the ones that are like, you know, would ground me like, you know, feminist, womanist theorists, which is what I think I needed at the point. So um, you have to really be clear about what do you need, right? What do you have, what do you need and how do you want to really proceed? And then also, I want also like um, emphasize the importance of not just like writing a generic statement of purpose, right? You need to read what is required, you know, by that school. 
what did they say they want? Um, how many pages did they say you should write, right? Is it a statement of purpose or a statement of intent or a statement of purpose and research in one or separately? So you, before you start writing, know what is required. And um, also like write it well. So people have talked about showing it to people. Yes, that is really great. But you would also think about like showing it to someone who has, you know, experience in this line, right? So this would be different from just like showing, I mean, sharing it with someone in, in your office who is like a journalist or who writes really pretty well. Uh, but it has to be someone who understands like how statements of such, you know, is written, especially from, you know, the global North, North America, right? So you'll be able to know you're doing a good job and you're communicating. Because of course, most of the time, we know what we want to write, but just like being able to communicate this sometimes might be a problem. And then writing it well, you might also look um, at, you know, getting like Grammarly, and I think you should be able to access, you know, some of those um, for free, right? So just like before you even like, share it with me or someone or someone else at least be sure that it's it's in some sort of good shape right and it will help you as you're writing then you're able to like make sure that it's written really well so um i guess that's some of the other things that i really want to say in right. addition to what yeah everyone has said i hope i right. go too much over time <laughs> yeah thank you um we are running a little bit with you know moving into uh, the time that the audience is supposed to use to ask us questions. So um, the panelists from this moment, you have allowed me to cut you as to move over the two minutes limit uh, because we have to allow the people to um, ask questions. All right, to reinforce what people have said, um, if I understand what people have been, have been saying, for the still our purpose, with the first thing to think about is why are you applying, right? Why are you applying for this program? It can be an experience in the past that has prepared you, right? It can be your family background. It can be your NYC, like they just said. It can be something in your background that you know already prepared you for this kind of thing. Um, I mean, you know, I mean that that stimulated you, right? Then the second thing is why this school? Why are you applying to this school as opposed to other schools in the world, right? You have to think about that critically. Then what prepared you for this program, right? What degrees did you have? Have you, you know, what research have you done in the past? what kinds of you know maybe organizational experiences that you have acquired that prepare you for this kind of program and the last one is what are your future goals right what do you want to do with this degree um faculty sometimes like to see that right um how the skills that are going to get on this program how do they intersect or overlap with the kinds of things that you want to do in the future all right um so the next question that i have here and like i said please two minutes um it's and I, okay, so I don't even so this is even better because I don't think everybody can speak to this. Um, post work, okay, I think everybody can speak to post work, qualifying exam, and reading concentration, right? So the qualifying exam, those who are already preparing for it, uh, will be the ones to speak to. It. And I think everybody can speak, of course, to post work. You know, I, I mean, what about that? Why is that? How do you go through that without burning out? Um, so I will start again with Digi. Oh yeah, so course works. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, this is this is the time that I feel like it's uh, it's important to talk about humility, right? You know. So, <laughs> once you start the coursework, you become very humble. <clears throat> um, you know, I have um, a few friends that have, you know, recently joined, and then you see that um, you know, the academic culture is quite different, right? Because um, we, I mean, back in Nigeria, I mean, a lot of schools in Nigeria, we just um, you know, read um, all these um, notes by our, our lecturers in Nigeria. But yeah, you have to read books like from Bali to Bali kind of thing. So, <clears throat> and then you have to get, you know, arguments, you have to, I mean, read lots of books. And then, so the, the coursework just sort of like humbles you, you know, that's the first thing that I have to say about the coursework. And then particularly, I mean, before, choosing your coursework, you know, obviously you have an idea of what you want to do, right? And then, so, you know, it's not like you don't know the conversation going on there, but because of lack of access to, you know, lots of those books, some of them, we, you know, we probably should have read them back in undergrad, but, um, you know, you, you know, you have a lot of access to books here and then you're just like, 
oh my god this is you know sometimes it's overwhelming um you know you go to the library i mean for my school even if you i mean there's no book that i've there was, there was a time where i just um, requested a book that had been written like that's very that just been published that very month you know so there's nothing and you'll be amazed that there's almost nothing that has not been written about everything mm, and then you have access to it so the coursework just sort of like um you know you, you know you just need to be humble and then as you start to, as i you know was telling you know one of my friends a prince who i'm sure will probably be here you know certainly you just need to be humble just continue to read you know knowing knowing that you know those things they are in steps you won't get it immediately that's the truth you okay, Nidia, can you okay, so, so so sorry to cut you but can you quickly speak to um qualifying exams so that we don't run over the time so i mean qualifying exam as in prelims right oh yeah so right now i'm actually preparing for my own prelims so i don't have the experience yet but you know i've started the reading so you have um sub different subfields and then you have um, to create a list a reading list and then so for each of those lists that you create you know you'll be asked to answer you know certain um questions you know that are related to the field and then you answer that you create a syllabus i mean at least for my for my own program you also create a syllabus and after creating a syllabus and then you write for the exam then you write um, a dissertation proposal you know where that's where the funding comes in so that um, you can go do your research so it's thorough it, it's a lot of work to do it's a lot of readings but um you have been preparing since you start your coursework so it makes it easy thank you very much samo um yeah um as per the coursework i wouldn't some okay let me just say this sometimes the courses that the department would offer for that for a term or section sometimes they may not be uh, courses that you are really interested in um at least that's my honest that was my own experience um sometimes um they are more into for example um the courses that were offered when i came in when i came to start the program um we were courses in medieval literature and all that and i'm like i kind of did all that um, in my undergraduate days, and I don't want to read all that again. So sometimes you would not always find the courses that you would want um, to do or to, to, yeah, to register for, but always look for the one that, um, that's, I, I would say that at least, you know, you could, you could do well at. So for example, it could be something that you had um, a strong um, background knowledge about, or perhaps if it's in relatively new uh, course, a relatively new field, and between them, you have so much interest. interest. And you have interest um, in that course, I would say you go for it. So um, concerning the comprehensive, so I'm also preparing for my two, and it depends. I don't know how it works in every institution. In my institution, you have to write two kinds, um, yeah, two types, kind of, write a major one and a focus one and so and you also have to come up with a reading list and i think the best thing is advice i would give to anyone who would for at least that's the advice that, that um i took where that people offered and i took is to communicate with your community communicate regularly with them um because sometimes you'll have to argue kind of why did you, you why did why did you include this in the this title in the list and all that so you have to always write a rationale or sometimes just talk it over that this is the reason why I'm yeah I'm including this title in the list and all that and again the you might the at least from in my own case I also you might have a little bit um of difficulty with forming a committee because sometimes if you don't have enough people enough um faculty members who are interested in your research Sometimes you just have to borrow people, kind of borrow people from outside the department or some other places, um, maybe in the within the faculty. As in, depends on how, whether your teacher use, uses the faculty or whether you use um, the uh, the name school. Maybe yeah. So whether the faculty, for example, the faculty of humanities, perhaps you have all you would have to look for people who share similar interests. 
maybe in African studies and all that, or maybe in whatever um, area of your research. So I think I'll just stop at that. All right, thank you very much. Um, it looks we might go a little bit, just a little bit over um, the time. But again, I, I have, like I have to keep the panelists uh, focused on the, you know, the questions a little bit. Um, so to Yemi, two minutes, please. Okay, so what I'll say with coursework is this. Speak to your course advisor when you're doing coursework. Yeah, like um, Kane, they said, the courses they are currently offering might not align with your research interest. So stick to your advisor, advocate for yourself. Like you need an advocate in grad school and you are your number one advocate and find an ally, which is usually your advisor and stick to the person. I have, I am blessed with an amazing person who is my advisor and he sticks his neck out for me every time. So that is about that. And when it comes to um, qualifying exams, we call it qualifying exams and people call it comprehensive. It's different from school to school. Again, your advisor is your, is your sidekick and your everything on this journey. Um, when it comes to um, reading list and whatever, stick to this person he or she or whoever they are is in the best position to walk with you and always speak up for yourself. When I was in my school or in my program, there are two qualifying exams. There's one you do like before you, you start your second year and the, the list is preset, but it wasn't set in stone and a lot of people did not know. I looked through the list and I was like, I don't need this, I don't need that. I went to my advisor and I'm like, can we change this? The second person on my exam committee, I went to the person too, can we change this? And they worked with me to change it. When I did my first year evaluation, the DGS of my program was like, that was a smart thing you do. You're the first student who've been like, I want this list modified to work for me that others just take it like, this is what they've been given to them. So they might not be set in stone if you, if you are, inching towards qualifying exam right now. And for the, for the comprehensive or whatever you call it in your school, advocate for yourself. The qualifying exam is supposed to benefit and get you going towards your dissertation. It is not for the professors or whoever is on your exam committee, it is for you. If it doesn't work for you, then it's not working for anyone because at the end of the day, it is still, it is still on you. So stay with the advisor, coursework, um, comprehensive exam, advocate for yourself, stay with your advisor. That's what I have to say. All right, um, thank you very much. And uh, so Theophilus, two minutes. Yeah, uh, br briefly, I think I like the word uh, humility that DG used in the beginning because it takes a lot of humility. Well, first and foremost, you don't go to graduate school with a sense of arrogance, especially when you're coming to, um, uh, to, to North America the the culture is different the academic culture is different and i'll i'll share a personal experience i remember the, one of the first classes i took when i first got to mississippi state university where i did my masters it was a split level course it had students who are equivalent to 200 level in nigeria 200 level 300 level and of course i had done a masters in nigeria then and i was doing another masters when we started and the students started talking I started rethinking everything I did because the depth at which these 200 level students were talking, the theorists they were talking about, I didn't know some of them. So the first thing you have to prepare your mind for is when you come to coursework, when it comes to coursework, the culture is different. The intellectual culture is different. So it will take you a lot of humility to first say, you know what, I'm relearning. And that is what you should approach coursework with it's 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 a relearning it's a process now you can now do two months into the program and you are now fully adjusted into it that's one of the things i'll talk about the second thing is because we are different uh you might find out that you find it difficult to get through the readings is a lot of reading sometimes you have five seven hundred pages to read every week you know it's 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 very scary but 
is what you really can do. So, and okay, they said something again. There are some courses you will do that you won't like. You will do it. Some of them, you they don't they don't they don't they don't correlate to what you want to do. You just give yourself. You invest your time to it. So prepare for a new culture, academic culture. Prepare to read a lot. The book you read in one semester in Nigeria, you can read it in one week here. That is the way it is. So it's it's overwhelming, but it's doable. I've not done qualifying exams, so I don't have anything to say about that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move to Yolanda. I feel like I'm just going to repeat everything Teofino just said. Um, grad school here is very taxing. Um, let's not get it twisted. Schooling, schooling in Nigeria is hard. Well, schooling here is also very, like you need so much resilience, like you have to know what you are out for. You have books to read, you have articles to read, you're writing reviews, and you're asking yourself, did I go to school? <laughs> because of how much things you have to, how much information you're taking in and how much you have to pour out. So it's very important that you come with the mindset that, yes, I schooled in Nigeria, but I'm also schooling here and um, a lot of things are expected of me. I also think I should speak about the importance of um, knowing your department's um, um, citation requirements, how to cite certain works. And um, it's also very important to think about plagiarism too, because um, there's this new thing. No, I don't think it's new, but there's something called self-plagiarism and it's very easy for you to succumb to that. So you need to um, think, ask questions, anything you're not sure of, ask questions. And the good thing here is when you ask, people are willing to help you and give you information. So ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, and then the last person, um, Esther, two minutes. Come on, thank you. So I'll just like go off from um, Teofilo's point about, you know, getting adjusted to the culture. So one, if you can succeed in Nigeria, educational system, you can succeed in not America, but you have to like re-strategize. So what you need is just like is a change of strategy. So just like you, you can't do the things the old way you've been doing them because the reading, the academic culture is really different. So thinking about like how much you have to read in grad school here in the US, for instance, you have to do what I call like smart reading, right? So how do you even read? So how do you get to like, you know, tons of pages like in a few, within a few time that you have, you only have 24 hours in a day. So reading for like the major points, what is the thesis in this thing that I'm reading? What is this author saying, right? And then probably if you would have to go through the topical sentences of each paragraph and then like read the introduction first, go to the conclusion and read and try to have a broader sense of what this person is talking about in this reading. And then if you would have to now come back to pay specific attention to a couple of places, you might have to do that. And I had to really like force myself into that because like I juggle a lot of things kids and all of that and teaching and all the classwork. So you have to really like re-strategize. It is doable, but you have to just be smart to just strategize and talk to people how they're getting by, right? So that you can actually learn from other people's mistakes and you can build up um, on that. And then talking about like um, coursework, there's one, what we do here in my school that we call degree plan, right? So your degree plan is what guides you into like the courses that you will take um, throughout your grad school before you now be able to do the qualifying exam. And I think that's like really important because it forces you to sit down, like draw the map of, so what do I need? What are the courses that I need? Do you need a minor, you know, so that you'd be able to like really thrive in your um, special area of research focus and then your advisor will be able to guide you through all of this since you're choosing the courses. And I think how your success in grad school starts from the first day that you start grad school. It's more like going into undergrad uh, school in Nigeria and you want to have a first class or a two one. It starts from the first day. You don't you don't start thinking about like in the third or the second year because you've already lost time, right? So as you're getting into grad school, know what is required. Know the requirement for the comps or um, the qualifying exam, whatever it is called. Know the requirement ahead of time. So as you're starting to take your degree, um, your courses and all that. You would have what for me I call like your life notes. For me, it's like it's a Google Doc where as I'm taking these courses, I'm thinking through how this is going to help me to meet these requirements and the qualifying exam. And I'm dumping it there, I'm dumping it there. Because at the end of the day, we might now come back, okay, now I want to do the qualifying exam. And then you're going back to all your folders. And then now it's when you're starting to think it's going to be very overwhelming. So I think it's just like, you know, 
putting these strategies in place helps take some of this because it's really a lot of work helps take some of this burden off you and um so just uh also there's something i've also like, really found you so is peer review right so i have um students here who are like my colleagues and friends like hey can you like read this for me and i will read this for you. so right because we are all really busy so if you have a, uh, someone who is your colleague who is trusted and who can like go over your work and like pro provide some feedback and all that even before it gets to your advisor and professor so you can really you know do a good job in your qualifying exam and in your writing and in grad school you know in its entirety i think it's pretty useful so make use of that as well thank you thank you very very much i think for me this is the i mean this is the real the height of it thank you very much it's it's really um very interesting to hear your perspective to so bring all the things that people have said together um the first thing that i have is don't, don't just be a robot when you're taking coursework right um don't just believe that you have to take everything the way it is it is coming be smart about how much you're i mean like how you're taking these materials how you're processing them uh you know professors that give you these materials also know sometimes that some of them might be realistic some of them might be unrealistic um so try to work smartly um and then another thing that i also heard is try to imagine how that I mean, the courses that you are taking and the readings that you are doing can satisfy several requirements. Can I take materials from this to write this paper? Can I take materials from this to satisfy um, comprehensive exam? Can I take these materials to you know, meet other kinds of requirements? Another thing that is very important is that remember that because you're in the department does not mean you cannot take courses outside that department, all right? You can move out of that department to go take classes in anthropology, and you might be in English. Uh, but you have to imagine what project you are going to do, what kinds of skills that you are going to be able to take from these classes. So if a department is English, for example, you don't always have to be in English to take all your classes. If you are in English and you're going to need archival research for your research, then you have to go to history or you have to go to somewhere else where you can, you know, get that kind of, um, you know, things like that. If you need field work, you have to go to anthropology or to oral history, you have to, you know, the um, history department to be able to get, you know, those skills. So you have to imagine things ahead of time before they come. And then another thing that people, that I heard that people said is, um, you know, you don't have to always accept the, um, and I think Omoyemi was the one who said that, you don't always have to accept the um, the least that people give you, the, the, I mean, you, you, I mean, you can negotiate, you know, this country is about negotiation, about, and not America is about negotiation, like people negotiate and say, oh, can I have this on this reading? Can I have this on this reading list? And think about as you are working on the, on you know, on the coursework, what kinds of books would be useful for your, you know, for um, um for your for your for your comprehensive exam? Then plagiarism. Plagiarism is something that is also very important that I think Landa mentioned, and I know that a lot of us don't often think about it, but plagiarism is a very big issue here. Um, so somebody writes something, I mean, wrote something, then you take a chunk of it and then you put it in your research, then that that I mean that might be a very big issue. Um, in this kind of context, I mean, sometimes it might be that you have to leave the program. Sometimes it might be that, I mean, that several consequences for that kind of thing. And it is very, very good to keep that in mind. Even when you are paraphrasing what other people have said in your own words, you still have the obligation to say, this is where this idea is coming from. So that people whose work you paraphrase and you, you know, pass them off as, you know, your own, your own materials can come out and say, well, this is not um, your material. This is actually something that actually came from, from my research. And they can sue you they can, because there can be so many consequences for that. Um, one last advice that I also have is try to publish while, while I mean while you're while you're working on the on the PhD program. A lot of people don't remember that publishing is part of this game. Um, they, that means they get to maybe final year before they start and ah, you know. So you don't have to do the first year, you don't have to do the second year, but as you're working on the coursework, and that's part of what I'm saying about not being robotic, right? The robotic is just basically trying to get A's and all the um, you know, and these things don't really matter here, you know, in, as long as you stay on a certain kind of grade, right, um, you can easily go through the graduate work. So what matters are the very concrete things that you are going to use these particular regions to do, not so much, you know, working to get A plus, A plus every semester, that kind, that kind of thing. All right, so these are the kinds of things that I think I, I heard people um, say, um, you know, from different perspectives. All right, uh, moving on. I'm going to jump on um, this question about adjusting to a new academic culture because 
our time is already spent. Um, conducting feed work and sourcing for external funding. Um, and I think that question would go to um, Esther, uh, will go to DG, and will go to, I don't know, uh, Yemi and, and Samo. I don't know whether Yolanda is already uh, working on grants or anybody can jump in at, you know, at, at any point. Um, so I'll go, I'll go to uh, Esther first. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so for me, one is that, so I found myself in a school that doesn't have pretty supportive in a lot of ways to be sincere, right? And I really love my program and my school, but it was one of the things that I um, probably really didn't know, but of course it's working for my good now that, right, there are schools that would give you like, you know, funding for the entire, for your entire PhD program, right? And then perhaps if I knew, I'd probably like, okay, put that on one of my, you know, criteria in my list of like looking for schools in the US. So it came in here, okay, so there are nutrition waivers and then you only get like certain amount of money in the first um, three years. And then it's just like really hard to like try financially and to do the kind of, you know, PhD, what I want to do, the kind of research that I want to conduct, I want to do field work and I really want it to be cutting edge, right? So I have this, you know, idea of what I want to do and I want to be able to get it done. So that was like one of my push to be like, yes, I want to get this work done. And then there's this financial constraint that I, you know, I'm not able to get a lot of money, you know, from my school to do this. How do I do this, right? So that was like one push to be like, yes, and I need to get this money, I need to look out for it. So I think, um, and then writing those um, application and grants is pretty time <laughs> consuming, it's pretty intensive. So you have to be ready to do the work, but it is really doable. So the way I look at it is like, if you're coming from a country like Nigeria and you're coming to North America for a patient program, you already have like something really you need to offer the world, right? There's so, there's just a lot of things that you can contribute. People have done a lot of research and all that, but if you look particularly in what is that something that is unique to you that you can offer, right? And then knowing what that thing is, then how do you like package it, right? <laughs> I just want to use the language that we understand. How do you package it? How do you communicate this to funders? Like you want to communicate this to uh, say the social science research council, or would give you like $25,000 to just like go to the field and get this work done, right? So before they would give this money, you have to be able to be pretty clear about what you want to do. And like I said, the other time it starts like from your day one planning to like, what do you even want to do? And you're pretty clear. And how do you communicate this research across, but not just to the people within your discipline? Because if you're writing, you know, um, grant applications, you're writing to people who would review it from multi-disciplinary uh, perspectives, right? So you're sending this um, to the Social Science Research Council and people from anthropology, sociology, English, history, African studies will be looking at my proposal that I, I, wrote, that I wrote from a women's and gender studies uh, program, right? So you have to be able to communicate this to people who are not necessarily like within your discipline, right? So, and then you have to uh, be pretty clear about how you want to do it, what, you, what questions you're asking and what your research is going to do. We talk about like the gap that it's going to fill and all that, but yeah, but how, how are you going to do it? So you have to really be clear about like communicating this to them and also like spreading it all out, right? If you really need this one that you will look for, I know it's really hard sometimes when you're in the US and you're looking for grants like this, because there's that assumption that most PhD programs in the US have this funding and you necessarily, you know, as an international student, you really do not need some of this funding because you're funding your program anyway. So you have to really be able to make the case of why you really need this money and how this is important. And then starting by looking out for what are those, you know, kind of funds that are available for you. So some would only fund people who are on the continent, you know, doing that kind of work, right? Or some, pro um, some fundings are like for people who are here, who are US citizens trying to like do this work outside of the US. So you have to look for the ones that directly like targets you, like, from outside of the US trying to do a work that is for, in my instance, like on in a, a subject uh, in Nigeria. 
So looking for them and then looking for what they require and getting peer review, right? Even as much as calling someone to be like, this is what I'm doing, this is my research, does it make sense? Like I've had to speak with a lot of people from history, from anthropology, and then at some point, at the time I was writing, I was able to see how my research is actually like interdisciplinary, right? Cut across this multiple, you know, disciplines and then being able to like speak from that perspective so that whoever is reading is pretty clear about how this is not just going to contribute to like women's and gender studies. This is, you know, a contribution to African, African studies, contribution to anthropology, you know, you know, contribution to even sociology and all of that, international development studies and not just losing focus. Being able to like, this is where I'm doing this from, but this is how, you know, it has all this multiple benefits and multiple research implications for all of those things. And I think it also like, you know, just applying to those and like help you to really fine tune your research, thinking about like, <laughs> what am I even doing? Because it would ask you questions that would prompt you to go back to the drawing table, right? What is it that I'm doing? And then a lot of times um, I also like found myself like, um, I don't like the word adjust, but making my um, reset, uh, oh, now adjust now, right? Because a uh, lack of a better word, I just need to, this particular funder, right? So what are their, their requirements? What are they looking for? And how am I able to speak the language that they would understand, right? And I think, yeah, that for me is, is, is really important. So I'll just like give an example and then I, I don't want to spend so much time. So I have to like apply to the National Science Foundation and there you would have to like, you know, do this from like more of like a social science perspective. And I was like writing for me to get the sociological program um, I mean, scholarship or funding from them. So I would have to like think about my research in th from that point of view, right? So it would be different from how I now like wrote the one for the Social Science Research Council, which, you know, allows me to like cry from like um, arts and humanities perspective. And I had like more liberty to really talk about like how my project is not, you know, is from a decolonial point of view. So it's just like, there's a lot of things it takes you through. You can be burned out and all that, but it's really you're able to do it, applying these strategies and then being pretty clear about how you're doing and how you can communicate it to funders. It's pretty important. All right, because of our time, um, the audience, I want you to send in your questions. You'll see the little box for Q&A. So sending your questions, we begin to um, move towards um, the Q&A now. Um, quickly, I want to call on uh, Yemi. So when it comes to funding or sourcing for funding or funding in general, I would say to any prospective um, graduate student, please factor it into your admission offers and, and places you're applying to, because that's very like important, but when, but, in terms of external funding, I want to believe that every school has office of funding and fellowship. So that is where you should start from when you're looking for funding, either like in whatever way, they pull together all of these resources from like all over the world and they have staff on there that would help you. I know like in my school, they have, um, you can consult archives of successful um, fellowship applications or funding applications. It's and it's there. Alone, alone. you can go in there to see like what the successful applications have been in whatever um, program you want to apply or whatever organization is doing, is doing this funding. So I would say start from your office of fellowship. And um, when you're writing the grant, if you know students who've written it before, like I'm in the process of writing one now and I had to collect like, can you please send me your statement for this thing? And so, and I'm reading, one thing is at least if you don't, if you don't learn what to write, you learn what not to including those people that did not get it, like what mistake did you made? And a lot of students are open to like sharing their experience. So I would say, start from there and everything good 
That is one thing I've learned. Everything good takes time. You cannot write a successful funding application in a week or two, trust me. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. The same thing with this admission thing with talking about, you need to plan and, and, and start writing, like I would say at least three months earlier so that you can send it to people and they help you like to, to work on it. I'm like on my fourth, um, what is it called? On my fourth draft right now with, with my advisor and he's so patient and he'd be like, we should take this out, include this. What about this experience? So find that someone, like I said, Mine is my advisor, who is like my academic cheerleader and sidekick. So that is what I would say. And doing field work, if it's necessary, do it. If you're researching in like books and you don't need to, I mean, like you're using like written stuff and you don't need to be out there looking for something. Don't just go because, oh, everybody's out in the field and, and I have to be there too. What are you looking for? So don't just take funding and go and do whatever. Like, and at the end of the day, like you, you've wasted the time you're supposed to spend doing um, quality work. My school, um, they guarantee like summer funding for, for every student. It, it is on your contract. And you can take that money and sit at home or you can go if you need to. So but just make sure whatever you're doing, it is something working for you, not just because everybody else is suspected, or just, not just because everybody else is doing it. Thank you very much. So we move on to um, Samuel. I'm not sure whether you, you're already um, working on your feed work or whether you're doing feed work. Not doing no, work. no, 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 I'm not, I'm not doing feed work. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, did you, is did you already in the field or already applying for grants? I mean, no, I'm not in the, I'm not in the field yet. So, so. Okay. Well, I think to, to recap, one thing that Yemi said that is very important is don't just think you have to go to the field. There has to be something that you want to go find in the field. And um, that's very important. Um, all right, we'll move on to the very last question, which is, writing your dissertation and preparing for the job market. And again, I think um, Esther would likely be the one to speak to this um, because I don't think there's any other person on the job market. If there is, you know, just let me know. Um, Yemi, are you already? I'm starting my dissertation. Okay, you're writing now, right? All right, so let's begin from you. What is the experience with writing your dissertation? So what I would, what I would say with, with the dissertation is um, find a team that is on your team. It doesn't have to be um, like, uh, first of all, follow your department, um, your program's guideline and, and requirement, but there is always um, an exception to the rule. So if it's one person who usually is your chair that is like from your department and you can choose others from else, elsewhere, ask if you can do that. And as for the job market, don't say, oh, I'm in my second year or I'm in my third, like attend all those job market talks and get an early start because uh, some people they like they're in their fifth year or sixth and they're like oh i have to go on the job market and you have no tools there are no weapons in your arsenal to to work with so start going to those job talks right now the mock talks the um how to navigate job market talks and you can keep so what i do is i keep a folder and i call it like useful for later and I put like all these tips like in there so that's what I have to say about that but for dissertation muscle tough if you're doing it thank you very much um Esther yeah thank you and sorry please send in your questions through the Q&A box so you see the Q&A box please type in your questions send them in so that we can move on right right into the Q&A thank you yeah so for now I'm just like drafting my 
chapters, chapter one, chapter two, and also because I've not been able to go to the field because of um, COVID-19. And also like um, doing telephone interviews as well, because that's what is only possible for um, with the traditional birth attendants and the women who use them. I'm doing that in Yoruba language. And I think the only way we could do that for now, just in the meantime, is just like over the telephone and recording the audio and then preparing to go to the field later. So I think like just writing and drafting my chapters now, I found what Yemi said to be very useful, like working with in a team because like can be very isolating, right? Now you feel like you don't have coursework, you're done with qualifying exam and you also don't want your dissertation process to drag forever. So trying to like, you know, make yourself accountable and look for other people who can hold you accountable to be sure that you're actually writing and not just like time, I mean, wasting time. So that's what it is for me now. And I'm trying to like look at all the resources that are available for me. I'm like writing with uh, some people on Zoom, we just sit and write to be able to hold one another accountable. Um, and also, it's pretty hard now. So it's such an unusual time to think about how one is being productive and efficient, but I'm really like really trying my best. Um, thinking about the job market, I think also it's something that one needs to start preparing for, like from day one of grad school, where do you see yourself working at? What do they require? And then just going to write the job address, the job description, and then the requirements, the degree, and then the um, expertise requirement would really like help you. How are they wording it? What are they requiring? What would they expect you to have at the time that you're really ready to apply? I think it's pretty important. What's the, your field, um, your field, what is that line that, you know, the advice is always like pointing to, and then how can you make yourself sellable in that, uh, from that perspective? And also like putting yourself out there, even as grad students. So I think uh, LinkedIn is a good way to like put yourself out there. You're not just a grad student, right? You're researching and then some of us are teaching, you're having this, you're gonna have these experiences even as you're in grad school. So putting it out there and then you might as well even be publishing already, you know, let that be there. Like, are you, uh, are you like sitting on a panel like this one? Are you on, you know, editing for a journal or what are you doing right putting yourself out there you might want to have a personal website which i've been working on like forever and it's i've not like published it yet but it's just one of the things that we have to do to put ourselves out there and then getting ourselves ready for that job market when you know we are actually done and ready to go in and all out thank you very very much this is a very um inspiring um uh, way to go so for the Job market, I think what I'm, I mean, what both Yemi and um, Esther said that I do need to reinforce is that start early. Um, the very good way to do it is that if you have never seen people present a job talk before, then you are always wondering, what does it take to present a job talk if you are invited? Um, and that was my own case, actually. I remember that the one job talk I was supposed to attend, I did not attend for whatever reason. And so when Professor Adrienta and Professor Adrienta is an expert in this, so it's a mentor who you can always reach out to if you have that kind of thing. So I was always wondering, so this job talk of it, how would, how would the thing look like? And um, that's a very important thing. If I had seen a lot of cases of job talk and there were a lot of people who were always coming on campus, right? Um, then you already know there is no big deal about presenting a job talk, like any kind of talk that you have been invited to. But having an understanding of that format, the way it runs, the expectations can help you. I mean, you have skilled one hold, so you are, I mean, like you're not bothering yourself what to do or how to do it, even though you are still going to bother yourself anyway. The other thing is understanding the job market. What are the websites to look at? Like, Higher Ed is a very, very, very good place to look at. Um, HNET, um, which again, Dr. Adrian introduced me, is a very good place, and you have a lot of history jobs on in there. But just studying these websites and having an understanding of the kinds of jobs that people post, um, you, you can get a sense of the trend, even though that trend can also change. For example, in linguistics, there was a time where, when it was language debt that was invoked and every job that came in within three years, I mean, a lot of those jobs were into language debt. Now, no more, like there are no more, you know, advertising that that kind of job anymore now. Like I think they switched again to apply linguistics. And now later they're going to switch to some, you know, something else. But whether that is the case or whether that's not the case, 
just being able to understand that this is the kinds of this is I mean these are the ways the world the adver uh, advertisement these are the kinds of things that they are looking for these are the kinds of research they expect you to have done these are the kinds of teaching loads that you are going to be you know expected to, to, to undertake these are very important things that even before you finish your program your mind is already attuned your mind is already developed you are already even more prepared for the job market before you eventually get there things things of the future are, are things of the imagination and the more you can imagine these things long before you get there the more realistic you're able to get there fast all right so now we'll open it to q a um the first question that I have here is, um, okay. Somebody asks, can an undergraduate student use a social media channel to keep in touch with pro pro prospective supervisors and all of that? So I think um, everybody is shaking and saying, no, it's not, a, it's not a great idea. So I wouldn't want us to waste so much time. And why it's not a great idea is social media is, it's, it's, it's not it's an informal space. So if you really want somebody to supervise you, Facebook is not the right place to go there to say, I want you to write them formally, introducing yourself, saying what you want to do. And I won't reiterate, I mean, I won't just repeat it. Let's go to the next, I mean, to the last week's um, video webinar where professors themselves were talking about what you do need. And they were speaking from different perspectives that senior scholars who have been in this gig for a long time. So please look at that video and you'll get an idea of what you need to do if you need to, 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 to I mean, how to, contact a prospective supervisor. All right. Um, the next question that I have here is, um, uh, I'm about to start the last semester of my master's here in Nigeria. Can I apply to the doctoral program in the US with my bachelor's? And if we can just have one person to speak to that, that would be great. I think I already answered that question. Like just check with the school. Okay. And if they would let you apply with with a bachelor's but i know like a, a lot of schools would not admit a nigerian student with a bachelor's from nigeria into a phd program but you should check with the school or just well, send the transcripts Since well i think i think it's possible though i think it is possible for you to apply from nigeria with your uh first degree i, I if you I think I think what you said is is good. Just check. I mean, check with the check with the university. Look at the university website because a lot of schools will tell you you don't need a master's to be able to apply to our program. Once you have a bachelor's degree, you can you know apply to this program. So, I mean, I think it works if you. I mean, it, it depends because some people have a first degree and they have done a lot of things that qualify them actually to come into the graduate school. Um, they have built a lot of a lot of you know experiences that when you know the, 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 the faculty, the graduate uh, admissions faculty look at their resume or the kinds of things that they have done. And I've actually seen such people, right? Um, yeah, so I, I, I would say it is possible. It is possible, but um, more than anything, think about the kinds of things that you have done to qualify you, you know, to, to go on to that program. I think that you have something to add, right? So I just wanted to say that I actually applied with my BA, you know, even though I have a master's, I applied with my BA, but um, the, um, the article I submitted came from my, from my MA. But I also know that a lot of schools in the US would actually, you know, give you an opportunity to just even apply with your, with your, uh, with your BA. So what they do is now that they tell you that your PhD program is going to be five years. Within that five years, you're also doing a master's, you know, so you are, I mean, for example, I already have a master's, but I also got another master's, you know, I haven't completed and you know, written another thesis. So I applied with my BA, they gave me the, you know, the promise of like a five year, you know, funding, which is for the bridge program, but, you know, you do your master's along, another master's along the line. If you have a thesis, it's because my thesis was not, was not in um, um, history, I would have not even had to write another, um, you know, thesis. So what, what that means is that, you know, it depends if you have history, um, for me that I'm doing history, you would be allowed to go on you know, with the program, but you have to take coursework, coursework, coursework. All right, thank you. I think somebody also asked about, um, how can I weave um, for proficiency, for English proficiency exams 
in the UK, how should I ask the admission panel to wait? I do not think, and I'm not speaking for all UK universities, but I do not think that UK universities um, would ask you um, to submit um, because they colonized Nigeria, Britain colonized Nigeria. <laughs> I think Nigeria is their burden, you know, eternal burden. So they have to always take. Um, so I don't think a lot of universities do. But if you are wondering what to do specifically, I know that Omoyemi I mean, said that contact the school because every school varies. And that is very, very important. You can always write to the admissions um, um, center and ask them. But if you're also wondering, next week, there's going to be the, the webinar of this nature where professors from different parts of Europe are going to be speaking to these same kinds of questions. So if you're wondering about going to Europe, Germany, UK, all those countries, then come, come um, um, join us next week on the same kind of uh, um, from, uh, webinar. Uh, so just look out for the ad button on the LSA's um, Facebook page, or if you're on the, uh, on the list, um, the list side, you're also going to get uh, the, the information uh, with regard to that. All right. To other kinds of, I mean, to other questions that people are posting, I think. Uh, Coming from a sociology background, which is focused on studying the society, how suitable is it to write proposals to study the society of the university I am applying to? And how receptive would schools or faculty be to me doing my field work in my home country? So I think we have two questions there, but I understand very well. Coming from a sociology background, which is focused on studying the society, how suitable is it to write proposals to study the society of the university I am applying to. And the second one is, how receptive will schools or faculty be to me doing my field work in my home country? So if two people can speak to that very quickly. So I personally am working on Nigeria. My research um, is on Nigeria women and the justice system in Nigeria. So um, I think they excite if you get a supervisor who is ex who 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 shares your research interest and is excited to see something about your home country then go for it i think if you want to write about nigeria write about nigeria you don't have to write about somewhere you don't know about yeah if i may quickly add although i don't get the first part of that question uh, the society of the university you're applying to that seems not to be clear but uh what Yolanda said is fundamental, and I would had I would say it like this: that in in the United States, in North America, there are, there are a lot of resources about Africa, about other places. So the best they have is the resources, but what you have in addition is the experience. So you come in here not only uh, with a knowledge of where you're coming from, but with the experience. Uh, I remember in one of my classes yesterday, we were talking about the material and the research and the researcher. And I told them, I, I said point blank, see, you can spend 10 years in Nigeria to come and do a research and you write all books, but I spent 25 years in Nigeria. You don't know the country like I do. So when you are writing from the perspective of your own country, you have a lot to contribute. You don't want to come to America and write about America. You won't have anything to say because you don't know the country like them. So actually it's a catch for you to localize your research in your country. It's, it's a catch because they can't beat you to that experience, it's, it's very difficult. They can have materials and all of that. So you only need their materials with your own experience. And that's the beauty. That's what makes us a lot attractive. If not, we won't get admission. You, in terms of language, most of them have a better command of language, but the kind of research ideas that we work on are things that are alienating to them. They don't really know it as much. So I will even say, Try to localize your research within your country. It's it's always the way to go. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think another thing to add is that I'm not quite sure whether it is not possible. So I, I from what um, Theophila said, I think I'm beginning to see that what the person who posted the question was basically asking is, is it possible for you as an individual to study the society? So for example, you're applying to an, to an American, I mean, to American institution. Is it possible for you to study, you know, the U.S.? And one thing to think about, at least for me, and I'm speaking, you know, um, uh, like uh, Nigerian, Nigerian society, on behalf of me and my family, and myself and I, one, one way to think about it is that it is possible um, to study that society. 
Uh, and, and I'm saying this because in recent times there have been discussions and conversations over who is allowed to study the other, right? Every time the gaze is, you know, is the other way. So we have a lot of Africanists, you know, who are studying Africa, um, who are white, right? And people are beginning to ask questions. Um, you know, why is it always that that agency to study Africa is always coming from the West? Why can't we as individuals not also study them? Right, so, uh, so if one places this kind of conversation within that kind of dialogue that is going on, then one begins to see that it is actually possible um, to study the society that one is actually applying to. But what is very important is you have to have something serious in terms to study about that society. What is new that we want to know about this particular society that you are bringing from your own background to help us illuminate, basically. And I think that kind of thing is very important. For example, I always wonder, um, there are so many things happening with, you know, the African diaspora, the new African diaspora here, Africans who are coming to the U.S. Re you know, in recent time. We need people to study such people, right? We hear about marriages breaking down. We hear about people being killed in marriages in Texas, in, in, the, you know, in New York, in different parts of America. We need people you know, anthropologists, um, sociologists, people to help us make sense of why these things are happening. I wonder, for example, why are these things happening? When people come from Nigeria, from different parts of Africa, and they come here, right? Marriages that have survived for 50 years. Why do they break down in one, in one day, right? So there are several ways of making sense of the possibilities of research. And I believe that these are questions that we actually need people to be able to help us um, illuminate. And that's why I'm saying the quality of the research of the topics, right, would, would start to. And when they start to, they will help people to say, this is the kind of research that I want to, I want to jump on as a supervisor. All right. And then we also have, um, somebody is asking, is it true that schools in the West do not honor postdoctoral applications from Nigerian students, like they would with candidates that hold Western degrees? And I think uh, Professor Adirito will be the, most qualified person to speak to this. I, I, th I think that question is beyond the scope of today's seminar um, webinar, because we're still gonna have another workshop maybe in November or December about postdoctoral fellowship. But I think we should just stick to the graduate program thing now. So the, to the person who is asking the question, we're gonna have another uh, webinar sometime in November or December about postdocs and this kind of questions can be addressed at that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. Um, then another one said, can panelists please share their statement of purpose they use to apply for funding in order to guide prospective applicants or can attendees contact panelists for such documents to prevent always applying fruitlessly? And I will leave this to people to answer. I think it depends on what you're applying for. Are we applying to the same thing? So <laughs> then you have to, like if I'm applying, for funding to go do research on women in Ethiopia. Do you want to research women in Ethiopia? <laughs> if you if that's what you want to do, then I'll share my my um application with you. Well, I, I do think, however, that what the applicant is saying is okay. maybe to have an idea of the template, right? Not so much that they are thinking of doing the same kind of research, but like if I because a lot of times, and I'm saying this because I sort of understand where this person might be coming from. People wonder what kind of template, how does it even look like? What you call a statement of you know of purpose? What does it look like? You know? So it might be helpful sometimes to share our documents, even though they can be very private. Um, if, but if you are comfortable, like is it possible to share these documents to you know some prospective applicants? Well, I was just being fastidious anyway. Like um, I think it depends on it depends on um yeah, sure. Like if if you're applying and you want a general, if it's a general template, because the person specifically said funding, not statement of purpose. That was why I I I said that because fundings are like research fundings are specific, so it has to be. Um, but LSA could start that resources, and I'll be glad to contribute. All right. Yeah, so I just want to quickly um, interject. So I think like we said, like those documents are like really private. And um, so for me, 
I had someone share this with me and I'm really like happy to share. But first I would like to know, like to see your own draft first, like what have you written? What are you doing to see like how serious you are with this? Because see my draft, you know, or my own um, funding application shouldn't be your own starting point, right? So you have to have, you know, finished your own work to some point and I would love to see that draft. And then I'm also willing to share so you can see, because really um, for some of these funders, the application process can be sometimes mystifying and you're wondering like, how do you even start? What do you do? And seeing someone's, you know, like, oh yeah, this one, the money could be very encouraging for someone that's like, yeah, I think I can do this too. So I'm willing to share, but I would like to know you to an extent, like read your draft and see like how serious you are. And it has to be like, you know, a one-on-one -on -one thing. And I won't have a problem doing that. Sorry, Prof, if I can add this, and please, even when people share their statement of purpose with you, don't plagiarize. I've heard, I've heard this story before, actually. And more unfortunately, the guy then also applied to the same school the person applied to. Don't do that, don't do that. This, uh, these schools have a repository of some of these things. So you, you really put yourself in harm's way. When people share some of these documents, it is to get you thinking. Uh, to be able to do your own work, to be able to do something nice. If not because you know them, you could get other statement of purpose examples online, you know, and you could, but even if you do that, don't plagiarize it. Don't, it's, your research is different. Again, when you do that, you don't, you don't really show that you are ready for graduate study. So yeah. when people share these intimate things with you, I don't mind sharing my statement of purpose with anybody. Once you contact and we talk, I don't even mind sharing the writing sample I used for my application with people. I can be that intimate, but you must be able to show that you are, you are responsible in a sense in which you won't plagiarize because you can put yourself in trouble. Yeah, I think I would, I would also like to add that the uh, first rule of thumb is that you don't ask share your own draft and when the other person is comfortable with sharing his or her own um, maybe our own um, statement then you can then share with that person but the rule of thumb is don't ask share your drafts um welcome reviews of your draft then when maybe i'm comfortable sharing mine if i think oh this could be helpful um i remember people shared um senior colleagues shared theirs with me but I didn't ask. I shared my sample statement, uh, my sample writing, and they, of course, they reviewed it a couple of times before they were comfortable sharing their, their own sample with me. So, yeah. All right. If what I hear is, uh, I mean, if I get it right, I think different people have different uh, things that work for them. For Theo, it's like, you can contact me. For someone, it's like, you know, don't ask. Like, So I think, we should just try to you know balance these things and like theo said if somebody shares the materials with you please take responsibility for the damage uh, for these materials um don't use them in a way that would put that person in trouble or that will also put you in trouble all right one person is asking how does one navigate application fee we talked about the idea of waiver the idea of waiver is basically to write to that institution to say that you're nigerian you you are basically okay no 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 okay i think the person is asking how do you apply for Waiver of application fee. Just to ask. Yeah, jump in, Theo. Yeah, the I think the last admission circle I did, I, I got about two, two application waivers. So the first thing you should look for is does the university have that? Some universities, again, this is why research is good. The university wants to apply to read. Some of them will say applications, application waivers are available. And they will tell you um, if you meet this, this, this requirement. Now, some you won't meet the requirement, so you won't get it. Some will tell you the requirement is, some, is what you can meet. So you then follow that up by writing to them. Now, again, it, it depends on their discretion. They can then offer you. They may decide not to offer you. But I think some universities will tell you clearly they don't waive application fees. In fact, some will tell you they don't waive application fees for international students. So again, look for the instruction. Some of them will tell you they waive. So in those places, ask. It is not cast in stone. Some of some you will get, some you won't get. But the most important thing is for you to read up 
uh, their policies in terms of waiver. So yes, some some schools give you, and some because people may not know this. Some universities you pay one application fee, and you be able to apply to more than one program. For example, in my in University of Wisconsin Madison, you pay one application fee, uh, you be able to apply to three programs. Now it doesn't mean you will get admission to any of them because that's another thing. Uh, some schools you just apply and uh, you can still get rejected. I, I think one other thing we didn't talk about is how do you handle rejections, but uh, is one of is one of those things. So uh, there, there are dynamics to it. All right, uh, maybe we'll check that. Somebody said um, I've applied for a number of scholarships and I keep getting rejections, and that is depressing. What can I do? What, what can I be doing wrong? If anybody wants to jump in, sure. I mean, I think that um, the first thing you are doing right is that you are here with LSE. So, you know, I think this, and I, you know, and I hope that the story, you know, will change, you know, eventually. Um, ultimately, one of the things you need to also get right is that, you know, by, you know, by now you should know what you are getting wrong. I mean, with the conversations we've been having so far, you should be able to identify that, oh, this is what I've not been you know, doing. And I think I would just tie that to the one question that I saw about, can I apply with to different schools with the same statement of purpose? You know, I think, you know, it shows that we need like, you know, research on, you know, the, the questions you are asking, you know, as, are you saying it hasn't changed? You know, have you not been reading? Uh, you know, have you just, are you just stuck, you know, um, you know, in, the, in that uh, particular position that you are in like the previous year? So, if you continue to do more and more research, you know, I mean, and then so hopefully by the grace of God, you will get it this time. Um, All right. Okay. I will. Do, I also like to add to that that sometimes you can ask um, the people you are uh, requesting um, money from. You know, ask them why they did not um, accept your application. Why they did not think it. Um, because I, I think I, I also applied to some grants in the past and I wanted to know why, why. So sometimes they, they will just give you some general, uh, sorry, it was competitive, not, but it just didn't meet. But um, a few times you could also get some candid replies from them that would help you. you know. And also, I would also ask, uh, ask the person whether he or she has been sharing um, this uh, research um, draft, uh, the ap application draft with others. Uh, I think that could also help. Right. Sorry, I just quickly want to add that, you know, I've, I had a friend who actually got rejected and then, you know, the guy just literally just, you know, speaking you know, with me, like, you know, he just like switched off and I was really, really worried, you know, for, for the guy that, you know, it's not the end of the world. So, mm -hmm. You know, you have to show resilience, and I think um, Chefilos mentioned something about how very competitive this thing is. I mean, you are talking about programs that are applied to in different parts of the world. So you know, don't see yourself as if you know you are not worthy. You know, and um, and I know that all of I mean the old panelists know that you know you keep asking yourself questions. I mean, a lot of people would also even have um, um, imposter syndrome when you get here. So it's not as if you are not enough. It's not as if you know, you, do, you are not worth it. You just need to keep, you know, trying. You know, you just need to keep um, asking the right questions, you know, network, talk to people. Mm. So don't feel rejected or feel like it's the, it's the end of the world or you are not worth it. You know, continue, continue digging, continue digging and continue doing. All right, thank you, um, DJ. If I may ask um, just something. So it, like, so this person just know that uh, one, I know you might have been improving on your, you know, previous application in subsequent, or, but just in case you haven't been, we can keep doing one thing, the same thing and expect, you know, like different results, right? So like putting in more work and also like going through to check if, um, asking for feedback, if they can provide like thing they said, and also going through their websites, who are the sort of people who have been getting this scholarship? What do they have reading their profile, getting to know them? And get it to know like, well, if this person can get it, I can also get it and not stopping. Because sometimes we'll see like, you know, um, oh, this person got this scholarship and this person got this scholarship. So sometimes we don't know like how much rejection letters they have got before that process. So I don't think it's everyone that just like, you know, applies one time and then just gets it. So like for my um, AAUW, I know like uh, 
the one that I just got now was at the third time that I was applying, right? So I was checking, okay, going back to my previous applications and looking through them again, going back to their website, seeing, so who won in this year? Who are they? What are they researching? What are they doing? And just getting to know uh, them. And then if you have specific feedback, like the NSF will give you like concrete feedback. They will tell you what is weak. They will tell you the strength of your research and just going back to like rework based on those, uh, based on those feedback will give you like a better edge the next time that you're applying. And just to say never stopping, just keep keep, at it, keep keep doing the work and make sure that you're improving at each time that you're doing this. And share with others, ask people. If you know like someone personally was got it, you might be able to ask them specific questions. And um, hopefully, like uh, Ayode just said, you will get there someday, it will work out. All right, thank you very much. So we have like two, three minutes more. Um, and one person will respond to the three questions that we have because we don't have a lot of time. All right, the first question uh, out of the three that we have left is, somebody is asking, is it important to interact with prospective supervisor to continue to interact with them after the first contact and presumably positive response, like do you need to keep just emailing them um, until... Um, maybe Professor Adirin Tov would likely be the person to help us address this. My plan is not to talk because I, don't I know, I know, but you are the I think you're, you're the best person to help us with this. Okay, uh, I think um, it depends on the context. If there's a follow up, right? I know that some uh, some prospective advisors would ask prospective students to submit their work in progress, the statement of purpose. It has happened a lot in which before you apply, can I have a look at your uh, your statement of purpose. And I can mention them, but I'm not gonna mention that. So I know some prospectives who will do that. So in that way, there's a reason to go back. There's a reason to keep interacting with them. But it's not just showing up all the time for no reason, right? So if you write them and they said, great, I think that your prospective topic is interesting. I look forward to reading your application. I think that's more like a foreclosed matter, right? They'll see you when you apply. But if they ask him for additional information about, can I have a look at your transcript that you can show back in a week or two? Can I have a look at the smith of purple that you can show back? But you can't just be reappearing on their radar all the time just because you just want them to know that you exist. In most of, in most cases, most of these introductory letters or email will always be, I think you're interesting. We're gonna admit this here. We have so amount of money for this. I look forward to reading your application. I think that should be fine. But just following up with unnecessary emails about ridiculous questions like where do I go to apply? You know, uh, you know these are not things. In fact, some, some questions, another thing I should mention is that the kinds of questions you ask can be a reflection of your, ready, your readiness. I, you can't be asking ridiculous questions like how, where do I find the application link? Where do I do this? this? So you should be very careful with, you can ask big questions, questions about fit, about uh, funding, about areas of specialization of professor, about resources, about support. Do not ask questions that are self-evident or questions that are available in the public domain. Thank you very much, Professor. I know you you didn't want to talk, but uh, we need somebody it's not scared to help us with this. All right. Um, then somebody asked, can GRE stand in for other exams for English proficiency? No. I don't think so in my experience. Will a PhD candidate go through coursework and qualifying exams? A PhD candidate, so I would just answer, a PhD candidate is, a, is that PhD student that has written the qualifying exams and has passed. So maybe they're in their third or fourth or fifth year, they have actually done all the coursework and they have written the qualifying exams. That is when they then become a candidate. I know that a lot of people, because it's fancy, the, the term candidate is very fancy. So people who haven't even written any exams will say they are PhD candidates. But technically, they are supposed to say they are PhD students. So they are not candidates until they cross that threshold and they are now admitted into the. So it's like technically the idea of PhD candidates is that you are not yet a candidate being considered for a serious PhD work until you cross that threshold. That because a lot of people finish coursework and take masters and go, right? So the only way we can know that you have now started your PhD in the real sense of it 
is that you have completed the coursework requirements, which is the first part, and then you have completed the qualifying exams, which is like technically the second part. And then when you become a candidate, we know that you're like ABD, which we'll call all board dissertation. You are basically working on your um, dissertation. So I think that's what basically that means. Then the very last uh, one is that letters of recommendation are very important. And some prospective students have troubles getting their professors to write letters that sell them. How did panelists navigate this? Uh, so if I can quickly speak to that, I learned this lesson the hardest and painful way. And I wish we had time to talk about rejections. So when I was applying, um, I was at UW and I applied. My application got rejected because of refer because of um, recommendation letter. And I still remember like I went home and I cried myself to sleep and ate a big bowl of ice cream. And I'm like, ah, and I cried and, and cried some more the next day till like I started to. So when I was, when I was applying to the school that I said found my name in the GRE directory, I kept in touch with the professor, with this person. And I had to be like, this and this and this and this is what is expected in, like in the recommendation letter. And I sent my statement of purpose. I sent my CV, everything that I could send to this person. And in typical, well, let me not say typical, that's, that's over generalization. But this person eventually was like, I, I asked, like, can you send me, sir, is it possible for me to see what you want to submit? Because the, oh, I've known Yemi for, she's a good girl, she's respectful. Like, that's not what you're looking for. Like, who cares if, you, if you're respectful? Anyway, well, they should care. But, so I had to say, can I see it? And this person was gracious enough. And I'm grateful that I, requested and I saw it because it was the usual, it was like five lines of she's respectful, she's hardworking and all of that. And I'm like, sir, this would not do, like, can you rework this? And then he told me to write a statement of purpose, uh, the recommendation letter myself and send it to him and he will modify it. So that was what I did. I basically wrote my recommendation letter. You might not be able to but walk with the person to make sure that they're giving you, they're not shortchanging you. They're not the reason why like things are not working or your admission packet is incomplete. Go back to last week's um, webinar. I think they talked about this also there. So if you want someone to write your recommendation letter, send your statement, send your CV, send them something useful you know, this and this is what I've been doing. And I think this is important to mention and all of that, walk with them to help you. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Um, I think the last question that this person has is the, the fee where the person is working now is different from the fee where they are applying. And I would just say that because of a time, what to do is to stress what overlaps with the area of, um, I mean, the, the kind of program you're applying into. Um, you can background that. It doesn't actually have to disappear, but you have to think about what counts, right? As experience, there are so many things that people do in universities that they don't learn how to put in their CV. Maybe you, the, you have the professor you know, do something, you were involved in an organization. There are so many things that count as experiences that you can bring together in a way that makes sense in your, in your CV. And while we can, we can continue to discuss this offline. All right, we have come to the end of this um, webinar. I want to thank everyone, everyone who joined us. And I want to thank um, Reza Saida Jirinto, who has been the one coordinating this, making this happen. I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank Samo. I want to thank Yolanda. I want to thank Yemi. I want to thank Theophilos, Ayodiji, and Esther. I know that all of you have different things that you could have been doing at this time. But thank you for coming here. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Your experiences count, the, the things that you have told us today the count and the people who are here watching us or who have here, uh, who have joined this webinar will learn a lot from it. And of course, this video will also be archived 
on Facebook and perhaps one day be on YouTube and people can always go there um, to find material that might be relevant to graduate school experience in North America. Thank you very much. Thank you.